Well, again, happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm glad you could find us and be with us and join us today. Hopefully, I can keep it under an hour. Because like I said last week, I had to apologize to those online. I didn't pay attention two weeks ago, and I thought Tom was doing part two of that. Two weeks ago, but now he's doing it today. So <laughs> I didn't pay attention. So, As we mentioned already, this upcoming week on Tuesday, July 4th, a day to remember the birth of a nation. It kind of changed Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, but if you wanted to say it like that, it's 12 score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. 247 years ago, this upcoming Tuesday, a declaration was made. God was with them. I know the News Nuggets Inside Preview, and Tom did a great job with that as well, News Nuggets and Insights, but many people ignore or don't know or have been deceived that God helped build this country and that he was there to help mend it. And that's the part I want to talk about first before we start talking about July 4th. Today is July 1st. Today is July 1st. You may say, okay, it's July 1st. Wonderful. 160 years ago this morning, the first shots ran out in the town called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. In a three-day battle that would become known and still is known as the bloodiest battle in American history. A three-day battle where Lee, General Lee brought his armies up to the north and General Meade brought his armies, his army to meet and have that three-day battle. The war wasn't going well for the Union. The war was not going well for the Union. Although they had technically won at, at, at Antietam the fall before, and that prompted Lincoln to give the Emancipation Proclamation, he was frustrated. Abraham Lincoln was frustrated with his generals. It wasn't going as he thought it was going. From July 1st to July 3rd, 1863, is considered the most important engagement of the American Civil War. After a great victory over Union forces at Chancellorsville, General Robert E. Lee marched his army of Northern Virginia into Pennsylvania in, eight, in late June of 1863. On July 1st, the advancing Confederates clashed with the Union's Army of the Potomac, commanded by General George Gordon Meade at the crossroads town of Gettysburg. The next day saw even heavier fighting as the Confederates attacked the Federals on both left and right. On July 3rd, Lee ordered an attack by fewer than 15,000 troops on the enemy center at Cemetery Ridge, the assault known as Pickett's Charge. Managed to pierce the Union lines, but eventually failed, the failed at the cost of thousands of rebel casualties. Lee was forced to withdraw his battered army towards Virginia on July 4th. The Union had won in a major turning point, stopping Lee's invasion of the North, it inspired Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which became one of the most famous speeches of all time. I'd like to share with you at this moment some pictures of Gettysburg. This is near the hotel that we stayed in last year. Union Battalion set up as it was to fight the Confederates. It's, it's weird if you ever look at the map of the battle. The Confederates actually came up into the north, came around and hooked around the north, and came from the north into Gettysburg. And then Union came actually from the south. So this is a battlefield. This is another battlefield at Gettysburg. Actually, if you look, actually, I think it's part of Pickett's Charge, if I remember right. In that picture, I should have noted it better. And if you see the old time photos of the dead laying there, this is what it looks like now. This is a picture uh, from Little Round Top looking down the Devil's Den. A lot of fighting happening on the second and third day of that. Confederates and um, 
advancing, tried to get the little round top, trying to get the high ground. Very famous battle of Josh, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain leading the, the, the main regiment. They ran out of ammo. They didn't have enough ammo. The Confederates were coming, so he, he told his, his boys to bayonet. And they held off the Confederate charge at Little Round Top, off to the side. This is definitely Pickett's charge, what it looks like now. This would be where Pickett's charge would have happened. As the Confederates would come from there, that far direction, and came towards the Union lines. You ever get to see the movie Get Gettysburg? You know, with Martin Sheen playing Robert E. Lee, that's, that's a pretty good a adaptation of what happened there. They actually filmed that movie, parts of that movie there on the, the, the battlefield. They actually gave permission for the producers and the filmmakers and the actors to be there to film. Some of it, not all of it, but some of it. And this is a picture of the Evergreen Cemetery. Many people don't realize where Abraham Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address. A lot of people are, have the myth that he did it on the bat, at where the the National Cemetery is. He did he did not. Over here in this private cemetery, you know what a public you know cemetery where people um, are buried, not soldiers. He stood over there, and that's the picture. I know it's not a real good picture. It's the only known picture of Abraham Lincoln being at this spot across the fence, giving the Gettysburg Address. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, Gettysburg, but this three-day battle was an important battle to keep the Union together. While this battle was going on, while this battle was going on, another battle was taking place down in Mississippi. The Siege of Vicksburg. The Siege of Vicksburg being run by General Grant was trying to cut the Confederate line, cut, cut the Confederate in two, Confederacy in two. And this was going on the same siege, the same battle. Actually, the siege of Vicksburg actually started back in May of that year. Actually, started May of that year, May eighteenth, and it stopped and it ended, and the Confederacy surrendered Vicksburg on July fourth, eighteen sixty three. I'd like to share some pictures of that from last year. I was able, I was blessed. We were blessed to go down and see this history. This would be Union Canyons. This actually be Michigan Artillery. That's why I took a picture of it. This is Michigan Artillery, where the Michigan group and some of Ohio, I believe, was stationed. This was, it's no longer the Mississippi River. It used to be. You might say, well, it used to be. What do you mean, used to be? Actually, over the years, it cut out a path. And so this is more of a, a branch coming off the Mississippi now. But this used to be the Mississippi River where gunboats would go up and down to siege Vicksburg. This is a readout where the Confederates were. This is close to this. And they would shoot shells at the Union ships that would go up and down the Mississippi. There's another picture of that readout with Confederate cannons. And this is the USS Cairo, a, one of those gunboats that sank and was stuck in the mud in the Mississippi for many, many years, uh, almost 100 years, I believe. I think they brought it up in, in the six, 1960s, and that's what it looks like, all wood. They try, they're trying to rebuild it, so, but that's the USS Cairo. Cairo, Cairo. You think it's Cairo. It's not. It's Cairo. <laughs> Another battle that happened at the same time as the Battle of Gettysburg. And actually Gettysburg finished on the 3rd and Vicksburg stopped on the 4th of July, but two major, two major victories for the Union to help keep the Union together. Lincoln was worried, Lincoln was concerned General Lee had again led his southern troops into northern territory, seeking the final blow to win his cause. He was eventually met by Union forces at and around the sleepy town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. 
Both sides had gathered together an enormous number of troops, and everybody knew that if Lee could push past his Union foes, there was nothing stopping him from marching into and taking Washington, D.C. The fate of the Union, and by extension the godly freedoms it was to protect, literally hung on the outcome of this battle. Edward Everett, the keynote speaker of the Gettysburg National Cemetery dedication, that's the gentleman that spoke before Abraham Lincoln in November of 1863, and he spoke for two hours, Edward, Edward Everett, concluded that the Battle of Gettysburg, Gettysburg had determined if America should live a glory and a light to all coming time or should expire, like the meteor of a moment. After three days of fierce fighting, which left countless bodies scattered across the countryside, the Union prevailed, causing Lee to retreat once again back into the South. In light of the internal consequences of Gettysburg, the following account of what Lincoln was experiencing in Washington, D.C., even while the battle raged, is ever so significant. Lincoln offered the following personal account days after the battle to then bedridden General Dan Sickles, who had lost a leg at Gettysburg and was now back at the Capitol struggling to recover. According to General Sickles and General James Rushling, who was also present, Lincoln stated the following. And I quote from President Lincoln. In the pinch of the campaign up there at Gettysburg, when everybody seemed panic-stricken and nobody could tell what was going to happen, oppressed by the gravity of our affairs, I went to my room one day and locked the door and got down on my knees before Almighty God and prayed to him mightily for victory at Gettysburg. I told him that this was his war, and our cause, his cause. And I then and there made a solemn vow to Almighty God that if he, would strand, if he would stand by our boys at Gettysburg, I would stand by him. And he did stand by your boys, and I will stand by him. Never before had I prayed with so much earnestness, I wish I could repeat my prayer. I felt I must put all my trust in Almighty God. He gave our people the best country ever given to man. He alone could save it from destruction. I had tried my best to do my duty and found myself unequal to the task. The burden was more than I could bear. I asked him to help us and give us victory now. And after that, I don't know how it was, and I cannot explain it, but soon a sweet comfort crept into my soul. The feeling came that God had taken the whole business into his own hands and that things would go right at Gettysburg. I was sure my prayer was answered. I had no misgivings about Gettysburg. Lincoln's prayer was a clear invocation by the leader of a nation of the national covenant with the Almighty. His prayer was answered. When Lincoln came to Gettysburg in the aftermath of battle to deliver his famous speech, it was altogether fitting that he slowly walked through the death fields of Gettysburg and viewed the fleshly, freshly dug graves through tear-filled eyes. He was reportedly heard saying, I gave myself to God, and now I can say that I do love Jesus. The American covenant would become even more pronounced on that historic day. As Lincoln wiped the tears from his eyes and stood to deliver his most famous speech at Gettysburg, he touched the very core of this national covenant and challenged his countrymen to enter into it. As explained earlier, the speech promoted the idea that the war's new purpose was the American covenant principle of universal liberty. And then came the invitation to the nation to re-engage under this covenant and its principles. The Gettysburg Address was a call to the covenant and the covenant connection expanded even further as witnesses and scholars expressed the belief that Lincoln's speech was an effort to present a vision of God's American Israel that reconnected it to God's original Israel. Furthermore, as noted by these same witnesses and scholars, the people in the North responded to Lincoln's call to the covenant at Gettysburg by devouring his words and immersing, them, immersing themselves in one fascinating... fascinating, 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 fascinating. If that didn't triple echo, now it's quadruple echo. <laughs> That's all right. They became a covenant community. God further assisted the nation in its recognition and adherence to the covenant by providing a sign of its power and veracity. On the very day the Union achieved victory at Gettysburg, another simultaneous and significant Union victory occurred at the Battle of Vicksburg. The fact that both of these key, victory, key Union victories on opposite sides of an embattled America occurred on or about July 4th, 1863, was received by the North, according to Manning, as an announcement of divine intervention and, a, and reawakened Union soldiers' millennial understanding of the war. It was during this spiritual jubilant time that a surge in the religious and spiritual nature of the conflict began to congeal. 
As such, most of the quotes and examples that refer to the Norse's newfound belief the war was now about national repentance and universal liberty under God surfaced most prominently during this time. Sergeant J.G. Nind summed up well these feelings in his own post-Gettysburg-Vicksburg reflections when he stated that now the nation will be purified and God will accomplish his fast designs. On that November 19th, 1863, this is Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Two minutes long, following a two-hour speech by Edward Everett. President Lincoln wasn't even the one, he wasn't even the keynote speaker. Mr. Everett was. He was asked as, a, as just a cordial, because you're the president, you come join us. And then if you would, Mr. President, could you just give some words, some key words, some, some words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who have give, gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know nor long remember what we say here, but it can never, for, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought ha here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here de dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln's Address. Remembering what happened 87 years before that, Benjamin Franklin said, Glorious it is for the Americans to be called by providence to this post of honor. It is a miracle in human affairs the greatest revolution the world ever saw. Making the connection between the fight for freedom and keeping the Union together. This is what Lincoln was talking about when he called back to the Founding Fathers. John Hancock said in 1774, Humbly commit our righteous cause to the great Lord of the universe. Let us joyfully leave our concerns in the hands of him who raises up and puts down empires and kingdoms. 1774 also brought a national plea from the Continental Congress. Refrain from every species of extravagance and dissipation. Pointing out the dangers to the nation of sinful behavior. The colonials believed that they needed to prove themselves worthy of God's help. Patrick Henry, from his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, 1775, We shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends and fight our battles for us. And in the Continental Congress, this was read, Psalm 35. After the miracle of Boston, Psalm 35 was read. That happened on September 7th, 1774, the beginning of the Continental Congress. Verse 1 of Psalm 34, Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear. 
and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord ch chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly, and let his net that he has hidden catch himself. Into that very destruction let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord, and shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he, he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my ad adversity they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me. And I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions. My precious life from the lions, I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies. Nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. For they do not speak peace, but they devise de deceitful matters. Against the quiet ones in the land, they also opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord. Do not keep silent, silence. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. And let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so we would have it. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Psalm 35 is a psalm of King David. As he came before God and asked for help and guidance in his time of trouble. So 247 years ago, July 1st, there they were. They were in that building. They were in Independence Hall, still... Well, arguing, trying to compromise, come together. They were getting ready to declare it tomorrow, on the 2nd of July. But they couldn't because they didn't all, they were not all unanimous on it yet. Thomas Jefferson had to go back and rewrite it with his last, late, his last draft that he would make. Because John Adams thought July 2nd would be known in history. But they had to wait for that final draft to come back because they couldn't, they couldn't be unanimous. They could pass it. They could pass it with, without being unanimous. But they wanted it to be unanimous in front of King George III say, we unanimously stand against you and want to break free. And so that the last draft came through and came in. And on July 4th, 1776, they voted and they unanimously adopted the Declaration of Independence. Independence Day ought to be commemorated, commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty, said John Adams. And at the conclusion of the Declaration of Independence, which Thomas Jefferson wrote, it says, And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. There's a wonderful... Paul Harvey said, Paul Harvey did a wonderful thing on this. Most of the founding fathers went bankrupt. 
most of the founding fathers lost a lot of, of their life, their personal life. Not, I'm not saying dying. They lost a lot of their personal things. They, family. Because of what they stood for. And I can't think of the name of You can look it up. Paul Harvey did a wonderful job on it. Talking about of what they dedicated themselves to. The people recognized the resolution as though it was a decree promulgated from heaven, said Samuel Adams about the Declaration of Independence. I just want to read the beginning of it. I'm not going to read the entire thing for time's sake. I know many places are going to read it. I know up on Mackinac Island, I believe they're going to read it. July 4th, they're going to come out. I think it's, I don't know if they're going to do it in front of the fort or not. On the parade grounds, behind the fort, they're going to do it. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a descent... A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel, impel them to the separation. So this is just a list of grievances they gave to King George. You did this, you did this, you did this. And many people don't realize that for it to be unanimous, Thomas Jefferson had to take out the part, the paragraph about slavery. He accused King George of being... of of slavery. He was the one that allowed it. The founding fathers wanted to get rid of it. it just, everybody looks back now so well, how come they didn't get rid of it? They could No, they couldn't have easily gotten rid of it. There was a lot of obstacles in the way. Even Thomas Jefferson's been quoted to say, we leave this for better men to handle. And I'm paraphrasing his quote. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By their creator. The founding fathers understood, and so did Lincoln 87 years later, that God was watching down and God had a hand. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to, to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. They knew that their liberties came from God, not from a man-made king. They knew it came from the king of heaven. I know we read the last sentence, but the last paragraph that had that sentence in it says, We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the recititude of our intentions, due in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies. Solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. They knew. They pledged to God Almighty. Congress knew that. Continental Congress knew that. As they're going through the Revolutionary War, they asked for fasting and prayer. George Washington in 1783, after the Revolutionary War. The novel is like, what do we do now? We won the war. What do we do now? Glorious indeed has been our contest. Glorious if we consider the prize for which we've contended. And glorious in its issue. But in the midst of our joys, I hope we shall not forget that to divine providence is to be ascribed the glory and the praise. I consider it an indispensable duty to close this last solemn act in my official life by commending the interest of our dearest country to the protection of Almighty God 
and those who have the superintendence of them to his holy keeping. Did they do it right? No, they were not perfect. Washington, Jefferson, Adams, both Adams, John and Samuel, Benjamin Franklin, they were not perfect. Later on, Lincoln wasn't perfect. He, Lincoln, I, I reread his prayer. He goes, I'm not up to the task. I need help. Why do I bring all this today? And I know I've talked about this before, and I know Tom talked a little bit about it yesterday in News Nuggets Insights, and he's going to talk about it again in a few weeks in his new sermon. I just, just as Josh said, I love, I teach science. That's my background, but I love history. I'm watching this stuff that's coming out. This live, there's live stuff from Gettysburg yesterday and this weekend. I'm watching. I was there. It brings tears to my eyes because of the sacrifice, because of the pledge that they made to God, and to see how far far this country is falling fallen from re respecting God and understanding that God helped set up this country. Why bring this all today as we're coming to the, you know, close to July 4th, 2023, as we count time? Genesis 17. And it's amazing to me the ignorance, and I'll use that word, of the, of, in general, I'm making a general statement of the American people regarding their history, our history. And the documents, whether it's the Declaration of Independence, whether it's, whether it's the Constitution, whether it's uh, Gettysburg Address, Emancipation Proclamation. Genesis 17, verse 1. When, a, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And it goes on about circumcision. But the point is he's making a covenant with Abraham. And your descendants after you. Genesis 26. Genesis 26, verse 1. There was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis 28, verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Abethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, 
that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he laid down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie. I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread about abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that rock, that stone, is, the, is said to be the coronation stone that was underneath the seat. If you saw King Charles be coronated a little while, several weeks ago. But it was, again, the covenant. Genesis 35. Genesis 35, verse 9. Genesis 35, verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. The promise of a nation and a company of nations. That would come out of Israel, out of Jacob, that is now his name is Israel. Genesis 48. Genesis 48, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. So he's going to bless Ephraim and Manasseh. And he says in verse 5, And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, so it's Joseph's two sons, who were born to you in the, in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Verse 8, Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me and I will bless them. So he's going to bless them. In verse 14, Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid on Ephraim's head who was the younger. And his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, No, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a great people, and he shall become great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Ephraim was to become a great nation. 
And Manasseh was to become the company of nations. Ephraim was younger than Manasseh. And in the ordering of things, Ephraim became the 13th tribe of Israel. I remember a message that Don Grimes gave many years ago. He, did it, he actually did it several times, and I remember the one he did in Jackson, about the great seal of the United States of America. So at this time, the great seal of the USA. This is the front side of the great seal. The eagle, symbol of strength and power, but always turned to the olive branch as preferring peace, clutching our national symbol from many, one, E Pluribus Unum. Each star slash strike, the original 13 colonies, the glory of 13 original states combining as one nations, and history's first attempt at self-government by its people. The stars and the stripes. The olive branch, America seeks, seeks peace. 13 leaves and 13 olives. 13 arrows, prepared to defend liberty. White signifies purity and innocence. Red signifies hardiness and valor. And Escrutian, represent, I hope I said that right, represents valor and virtue protecting the eagle with the 13 bars representing America's original 13 states. 13. I remember Don always saying, why do you think the world thinks 13 is unlucky? You know, we got hotels that will skip, go from 12th floor to the 14th floor. Mm. And I, I agree with Don. It was It's a deception by our enemy to say, 13's unlucky. No, it's not. 13. If e, Ephraim's the 13th tribe, E pluribus unum, 13 letters. And I doesn't say that on here. 13 letters. the backside of the seal of the United States of America. The eye of the Creator looking upon this new attempt at self-government while watching over and protecting the nation. The light of God, the providence shining on a new nation based on God-given unalienable rights. I have no idea what that says. It's Latin. It's, uh, I actually think it's, it's Latin. I don't know if... Yeah. But it, it's, it's in English. I knew it. Coepit, I have no idea, it means he, God the providence, favors our undertakings. That's 13 letters. Blue signifies vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Pyramid symbol of strength and durability. Of course, in Roman numeral 1776. 13 layers of an unfinished pyramid representing the 13 original colonies building a new nation based on new ideas and concepts of self-government never before attempted. And this is Greek, I think, or I don't know. I'll be corrected probably here in a moment. But it represents, it says, New Order of the Ages, symbol of a new nation built on the concept of permanent, unalienable, God-given rights for all versus, versus vested, man-made, and non-permanent rights. The seal of the United States of America. Now, I didn't put it up here because Tom showed it, News Nuggets Insights, what Benjamin Franklin wanted the seal to be. Benjamin Franklin wanted the seal of the United States to be the Red Sea crossing with um, Moses and the Israelites and the Pharaoh and the cloud, the cloud by day and the, and the fire by night on the seal. But they went with this, 13, 13. Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30. Verse 23. 
He says, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it, and until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days you will consider it, because he's talking about the sins coming up to him. And we're going to go straight into chapter 31. Verse 1, At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all, of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines, and shall go forth in the dance of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise, and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame, the woman with, woman with child, and the one who labors with child together. A great throng shall return there. They, they shall come with weeping and with supplications that would lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters, in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Ephraim is God's firstborn. Verse 18 of that same chapter, Isaiah 31, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastened me, and I was chastened like an untrained bull. Restore me, and I will return, for you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning I repented, and after I was instructed I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I bore the reproach in my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. What Ephraim holds in God's heart. And the love. and that, He loves all creation. But God, his words speak. Second Samuel 7. Second Samuel 7. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 9. And he's talking to David. He's, he's talking to David, making a promise to King David. He says, And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. They're already there. He's talking to David. He's already in the promised land. He's already in Israel, J Jerusalem. He's talking about a new place to carry them. To carry a place full of freedom. Of liberty. Of opportunity. He's talking about modern day Israel. Modern day Ephraim. The country that we will celebrate 247 years on July 4th. A place to worship God Almighty without, well, without worry. We see these freedoms being taken away because we do not know, we do not remember. This country does not. This country worships our enemy, a different God, a God that enjoys sacrifice of children, a God that says it's okay to break the Ten Commandments, the laws of liberty.
we still have a choice to be lights. We still have a choice, as it says in Matthew. Let's go there, Matthew, because I'm going to bring back at the end of this. Message. We're getting close. I know a lot of history today, not a lot of scriptures. It's probably worthy of two messages. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is isn't good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, the world sees our works now. We have foreign leaders telling us that we're wrong. That we don't follow God anymore. And they're right. They are correct. This nation has turned its back on God. As it says in Isaiah 1. Let's go to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. A last sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. We live in that nation now. As I've said before, history is repeating itself. Just like it did with ancient Israel and how they were taken into captivity because of their sinfulness and what they did and they sacrificed to other gods. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me, says the first commandment. And as a country, we've again forgotten that. And among the other commandments that are being broken, verse 5, Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints, from the sole of the foot even to the head. There's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with the ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. I know the fires that were happening in Canada weren't in the United States, but my goodness. The fires from Canada, especially in the northern part here. It was like, what is going on? Fog. It looked like fog. It looked like it's supposed to be raining. It's smoke. And it's going to get worse and worse. And we do have cities that are burned with fire, with revolt and, and things happening. People going out to protest and they think it's all right to light things on fire i mean that's that is happening as well and strangers devour your land in your presence and as desolate as overthrown by strangers our country has forgotten the freedom that is in christ jesus romans 6 our country has forgotten its way romans 6 Verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. We have freedom through Christ. We have freedom because of the righteous law that was given. We have spiritual freedom. Those that still stand, we, we mourn and cry for what's happening around us physically. But spiritually, we still have that freedom because we follow the laws of Christ. As James says, James 1, 25...
James 1.25 says, But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So we need to keep going. We need to remember the hard work of our founding fathers. Even before that, the pilgrims who left Great Britain, who left England, who actually left the Netherlands, actually, but for religious freedom, to worship God and only Him. James 2, verse 12 So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. That is what God is judging us. Our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ is judging us on. The law of liberty. And he worked with them. He worked with the founding fathers. There's no doubt about that. People can deny it. People can say, no, Washington was an atheist. And Jeff, no, there's proof upon proof upon proof that they were not. And they gave glory to God when they could, when they remembered. You know, people forget. They were arguing. And we'll talk more about when we get to the Constitution. That was a hot mess before they sat down and prayed. We'll get there in a couple months. About the Constitution again. Following God's laws gives us freedom in life. Respecting God, the Creator, and the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self evident. The law, the truths of God. The law of God. Psalm 19. I know I'm getting close, probably past an hour now, but I'd like to wrap up here in a couple minutes. Psalm 19. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, they than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Just as ancient Israel lost their way and they forgot where they came from, our country has. No doubt about it. They say, God bless America. They don't mean it. They don't mean it. They don't know. But we do, as God's people. As the physical struggles, the physical does struggle around us. We struggle as physical beings. But we have the Holy Spirit in us to overcome that as the physical struggles and it falls and it crumbles around us. We have been chosen. And yes, we've been chosen. Sometimes we sit there and stand and say, why me? To make the choice to lead a life that's full of freedom. Freedom that God himself has given us. And we have to remember that physical freedom that God has given us. Yes, that's being taken away day by day. By the powers that have been elected in, by the powers that be. There's no doubt about that. There's some standing up still tall. There are still some standing tall. But spiritually, we are free. Free to worship God. Free to pray to God. Free to live the life that He's told us to live. To follow His commandments. The pilgrims on the Mayflower at landing fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean. Come, let us declare the word of God in Zion. That is quoted from William Bradford's writings when they landed at Plymouth in 1620. 
John Winthrop said in 1630, The Lord make it like that of New England, for we must consider we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. That's what this country is facing today. We are this country is becoming a story. It's becoming a byword. Again, there's people striving to keep it up, but we know that Christ must return, and He will return, and this country will fall. And that's sad, but the kingdom will be coming soon. Sooner than later, we pray. As we wrap up today, regarding the spiritual, we have freedom because Christ died for us and has shown us the way to the kingdom that kingdom that we pray for it on a daily basis. We are to be lights and cities on the hill. We are called to do that. Christ said in Matthew 5, you are a light. We are to exc exclaim our freedom to those around us by our actions and our attitudes. We are showing the freedom of the spiritual promise that mankind will be saved and that Jesus Christ is returning. And God had a hand in the physical of this country being set up, so we had those freedoms, and we still do as of this day, to stand tall and say and show what we believe. At that time, a jubilee will be celebrated. If you read the 50th, I don't have time because time is, I'm probably past an hour. Yeah, by a couple minutes. So I will wrap this up. In the 50th anniversary in 1826. If you read and you look up and do research, there was a celebration beyond any celebration in America in 1826. It was the 50th year of the Declaration of Independence. They considered it a jubilee. They took the Word of God and said, it's the 50th year. It's a jubilee of freedom. And on that July 4th, two very important men died that same day. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. The people, the citizens, wanted them to come to their celebrations, their jubilee celebrations, but they were weak. And they were sick. And they both died on July 4th, 1826. John Adams' last words were, Thomas Jefferson still survives. And actually, Thomas Jefferson was the first to pass away that day, before John Adams. But the country was celebrating a jubilee in their eyes. They didn't, we didn't, they didn't know what the exact jubilee is based on Hebrew calendar, but they knew it was 50 years. And they were getting ready for a jubilee. How far, again, we've fallen as a country. But, again, God has used this, has done the physical to make way the spiritual, His people in this day and age to have a place to worship, a place to be free to worship Him and to be lights on a hill. Let us remember the great plan of God and where we've come from, from the beginning of history to now, the beginning of our country and to now. Let us remember our heritage. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's Ephraim. It's Washington. It's Jefferson. It's Adams. It's Franklin. Lincoln. And all the others that paved the way that God has used to make it so that we can still be free. We can worship God. Let us remember that because it's from God. His inheritance. And soon to come is our Savior to give us our inheritance on this earth. The kingdom of God. Praise God.
thank him for our liberty. Thank him for our freedom. And let our freedom ring.